Greetings out there, friends of Master the World. Evan Goldstein here, and we are going to be on Kit 122A today. And we will be back, we're on a recording, but we're going to be back with 123A next month in November. So stay tuned for that. If you're wondering where my beautiful dining room, where all my bottles are, it's because I'm not in my dining room. I'm actually out here in Columbia, Missouri, visiting my son at graduate school, and I got a big white backdrop. I'm joined today by my dear friend, Madeline Trafon. Madeline, where are you? I am at home in Southgate, Michigan, which is officially Metro Detroit, and I am in my office uh, with uh, my actual bookcase as my backdrop, which I tidied up just for you and your guests, our guests, I should say. Happy to be here. Here we are with wine number one. And uh, as always, I love to look at everything against a white surface because all of a sudden wine number one is not just white, but it's a uh, brilliant pale straw with green glints, which just to remind us all usually telegraphs youth. And on the nose, it's so cheerfully aromatic. Imme immediately citrus um, pops out, specifically both pink and white grapefruit and uh, key lime. It's mouthwatering and putting my nose in the glass, it actually smells bracing. It smells a little bit like sea air. Evan, you want to add anything to the aromatics or can I go to the palate? No, no. I, the only thing I would add is that, yes, I'm getting that sort of sea air, almost like a sea spray or a salinity to it, which suggests maybe there's some water somewhere out there. Um, <laughs> I'm picking up the same quality of fruit that you're getting. I'm maybe getting a little bit more pith and a slight bitter or the oils from that grapefruit, but I think the grapefruit screams. I'm also getting a little bit of that sort of like kind of lanoliny, woolly kind of thing in there too, which actually leads me to a thing I'll talk about later. What a good idea. And then I'm going to transition to the palette, though, you know, we're really considering fragrance and flavor together. Mm -hmm. um, on the palette, actually, I get uh, an attack of um, that beautiful citrus fruit that has an illusion of sweetness, almost a passion fruit in uh, in quality, though both the pink and white grapefruit come through. I love that you talked about the pith and the peel because there's a little bit of, teeny little bit of phenolic bitterness on the palate that adds to um, the interest factor of this wine. The acidity is compelling. It's actually quite high, but there's so much of that juicy ripe fruit behind it that it's not um, bothersome. It doesn't shut down the flavor of the wine. It's lean, it's tart, it's quite long actually. And going back to the aromatics, I think there's a lovely um, lemon or lime blossom aromatic to this. And there are little hints of uh, what I would call a green element, whether you want to call it jalapeno or maybe a little bell pepper, um, both on the fragrance and the flavor. Evan? Yeah, no, I, I concur with you. Don't have a lot to add, frankly. I, mm -hmm. I do think that there's something going on here that's sort of softening the blow because while the acid is still sharp, there's actually a slight mm -hmm. roundness to the texture. It's not all angular and um, hard edges. Uh, there is a brightness to it. It's refreshing. Um, you're getting all of the sort of echoes of the citrus elements you talked about. I do pick up all those blossomy white uh, elements that we talked about too in terms of the florals, which are all very fresh and very clean. Um, it's sort of uh, expansive in the back palette, a little bit, uh, little bit long. Um, and it's definitely speaking to me in a fairly interesting voice. I'm picking up something that screams one thing to me, but there's something else there too. I'm not sure exactly what it is for right now. Fair to say from what we're saying that this is a, an aromatic wine. This Absolutely. is highly aromatic, uh, cheerfully aromatic, expressively Absolutely. aromatic. So where do we think we might be? What, I mean, what are you starting to think about? So uh, just to um, shorthand our comments on wine number one, we're talking about a white wine that um, appears at this tasting to be highly aromatic. It's got compelling acidity and it seems to have an influence of um, possibly a maritime influence because of the sea breeze aspect, but it is uh, it has a touch of minerality, but again, that's not dominant. So I'm very curious to see where it comes from. And as a PS, the alcohol is balanced. So where are we in the world with this? We are leaving Detroit where I'm tasting this wine and I wonder where in the world we're going because Evan and I are a little torn, whether we're either, even in the new world or the old world in terms of how this wine is expressing itself today, though it does have explosive fruit. We are going to South America. We are going to Chile. We are going to an area southwest of Santiago inland in the Calchagua Valley. 
And there we are, Marchigue within Colchagua. And uh, it makes sense. Uh, the maritime influence is real. The Pacific breezes are coming in with enthusiasm from the West. Right, Evan? Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, when they think of Colchagua, they think inland, they think more in the Entre Cordilleras area, but there is a Marchigue. Well, there is Marchigue. Marchigue is in Colchagua Costa. Costa, of course, being closer to the water so that salinity and the cooler climate coming with it is going to ramp up that acidity and um, give you a lot of freshness. And here is the revealed wine, Calcu Reserva Especial from the Colchagua Valley. Sauvignon Blanc Semillon Blend, um, which is a surprise to me, though Evan spoke to it a little, that the Semillon is maybe reining in the uh, exuberance of the Sauvignon Blanc. I think it's a remarkably delicious wine. It certainly speaks to the um, aromatic quality of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, alcohol is balanced. Um, the mouthfeel is lean and tart, but delicious. And uh, again, I'm surprised it has significant amount of semillon. It's like one third. But uh, do you want to speak to that, Evan, since that is yeah. uh, something I, that you notice? Absolutely. Semillon is something for those people who study Chile. They know that, you know, it came over with Cabernet Sauvignon, with Merlot, with uh, Carmenere, with the Bordelais back in the mid 1800s. What I think most people are used to, however, is because all of that was in the Central Valley, it being slightly warmer climate. Here, the cooler climate is not giving you the sort of upfront figs and ripe pears and stuff like that that semi can give you but it is giving you some texture and the texture here is not sort of plush and pillowy rather it's a softening effect of the sauvignon blanc mm -hmm. and i'm going to say one ps to this why not new zealand you know broad stroke i don't think it has that compelling kiwi passion fruit character um, that new zealand sauvignon blanc um, inevitably gives me so you know you might wrestle with that a little but remember, we think of Chile as, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon land, but it really should be considered in memory as Sauvignon Blanc land as well. I think that at its best, the Sauvignon Blancs from this country are just gorgeous. And it is the number one white grape grown there as well. So it's important to note that it doesn't have that, that brashness. It doesn't have that gooseberry, that passion fruit. Um, it's a softer, it's more citric, uh, but still very Sauvignon in character. All right, let me grab and start off on wine number two. We're going to alternate here back and forth. And this wine has certainly a darker color, a richer color than the wine that Madeline just showed us. It's almost sort of in that sort of deeper straw, pushing towards a sort of yellowish color, but also bright, also uh, reflects light nicely, et cetera. Uh, the nose here is quite taut right now. And my glass has been open for a while, but I'm getting elements of tree fruits. I'm getting apples. I'm getting some quince. I'm getting some pear. Uh, I'm getting a very soft undercurrent of citrus there, but not so much as I am the orchard fruit. I'm also getting a strong sense of, uh, of a rockiness, a minerality, a je ne sais quoi. That is not something that I would necessarily associate um, with fruit like this from other parts of the world than where I think it is. I'm just thinking right out, off that from the top of my nose. A little bit of blossoms, a little bit of floral, a little bit of herbal, maybe a kiss of rubina, something like that, some Meyer lemons and some blossoms. Structurally, the wine is bright, it's refreshing, um, it's delicious, but it also has texture. It's got that sort of middle palate roundness, a smoothness, almost a creaminess to it, but not overdone. Everything here is just perfectly lined up and in place. You have texture, acid, you have fruit, you have creaminess, you have minerality, you have everything in the right place, but it also seems incredibly young, like it's got great future in front of it. It also seems to me, just quickly as an aside before I hand it over to Madeline for you to comment, I feel it's made by somebody who really knows what they are doing. <laughs> this is an artist's work. This is a, this is a, uh, a Rembrandt of its uh, genre. I'm going to chime in if that's okay with you. I absolutely. think you, you described it artistically and um, I agree with absolutely everything. I will say too, to your point of mid palate that when you hold it on your palate, there's a depth of, of flavor that speaks to low yields, possibly older vines. You know, it's hard to put your finger on that. It also has, even though um, you have acidity that pulls the wine into its finish along with that inorganic earth, um, mid palate, you've got that satiny mouthfeel that comes from a combination of perfectly ripe fruit. And I think Lee's contact, there is a whisper 
of vanilla and oak, a whisper. So what comes to my mind is probably possibly um, used barrels. And I loved how you described the aromatics because it, it is absolutely textbook tree fruit, perfectly ripe uh, pears and apples. The color, by the way, just to remind us all, when you see that bright yellow verging on pale gold, it's speaking to one of a couple of three things, maybe a little more bottle age, maybe um, uh, expression of having been uh, in a barrel as opposed to an anaerobic state, but it's just a beautiful wine. It gently holds your attention. Really lovely. Okay, uh, do you wanna go into where you are in this world? Yeah, I was gonna give you a pause so you could edit it so <laughs> do a smooth thing about it. You tell me. Oh, go ahead. Do you wanna have the Google Earth up or no? Um, I, I, I'll have a hard time knowing where to stop if I'm not- Got it, this. got it. You know what, let's uh, resume recording. So first let it go to Columbia, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, don't go into, we're going to let it land in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And then um, after you see my left-hand side screen go away, that's when we should start. Where, where, um, it, says, where it says Colombia in this whole box, once that box goes away? No, no, no. Once, um, this is going to go away anyways. I'm talking about um, this part. See this right here? Okay. Because I have to open this and it shows mm -hmm. my ID. So uh -huh. let that go away before you are going to give me a okay, clean. Okay, let the left hand navigation go away. Correct, correct. Okay. Um, right. Oh my God. Where, why did you do that? Um, okay. So I'm going to let this one go away and then you can start. Okay. Oh, why didn't it go away? Oh God, I pressed the wrong thing, hold on. Jesus Christ. Okay, now you can start. Well, leaving Columbia, Missouri and the University of Missouri, where I am right now, we're jumping up into the sky and I wonder where we're gonna land. We talked a lot about things that to me seemed like extremely old world clues. So we're ending up in Europe, that's a big ha ha ha. And we're ending up in France and it looks like our little uh, cursor here is gonna buzz us into the Haute Côte de Nuit. So we are in the Northern part of the Côte de Bonne in the Côte de Nuit, specifically in Haute Côte de Nuit, which means you're in the Western escarpment outside of the towns. Nuit Saint-Georges would probably be your marker for all of this, but it really is the entire escarpment there that goes over. And what's interesting about Haute Côte de Nuit, which speaks to the acidity we were talking about, Madeline, is they are slightly higher in altitude. Vineyards that are actually very well positioned for climate change. And specifically, where in the Côte de Nuit we are, is going to be at the wonderful estate of Michel Gros. And um, a couple of things here. First of all, you have the great icon, the lion, Jean Gros, uh, on the far right-hand side there. Michel is his son. Uh, Jean Gros is somebody that I actually know back to my Seagram days a long, long time ago and visited at his property. His son took over in 1995. His father sort of retired and not only took over making the wines of Domaine Jean Gros, but he's also making his own wines now, too, under the name of Domaine Michel Gros. This is a monopole, which is to say he owns and works with this entire vineyard of Fontaine Saint Martin, and literally it speaks to a single place, which is what I love about it. Because when you think about Haute Côte de Nuit, that could be a lot of things, but this speaks as a very singular wine, and it speaks of pedigree, it speaks of artistry. So when you find out it's made by uh, such an incredibly talented, uh, time honored family, not a surprise there at all. Your thoughts? You know, what's interesting too is looking at the label, and I think it's so thoughtfully done because the term monopole is positioned to let you know that it's ownership of the single plot, but also it's Bourgogne Blanc with a slightly more specific sub-appellation Haute Côte de Nuit, correct? And when Evan and I were talking about this wine, if you really gave this to me blind, I would be hard pressed. I'd, I'd, I'd probably deduce it was white burgundy. It's a beautifully classic expression that I think you can memorize um, as Chardonnay that's handled depth, depthly from, um, you know, uh, an area that certainly has uh, classic terroir, but where would you place it? It's not Chablis. It has more pedigree than most Cote Chalonnaise. Would you say it was possibly, you know, Merceau? You know, either term Haute Cote de Nuit wouldn't occur to me, but I certainly would know that I was floating around somewhere 
in Burgundy but, proper, uh, holding hands with a terrific winemaker. Yeah, I, I concur with that. I would say I would be in the Cote d'Or for sure somewhere. I wouldn't say yes. Cote de Nuit or Cote de Nuit because I think most people by you know, sure. It doesn't occur that, to us. Yeah, it because it's, 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 people us. think of it being red wine territory, but in fact, mm -hmm. most of the fruit planted in the Haute Côte de Nuit is actually is actually white fruit. It is Chardonnay. What I would speak to would be something that's got some texture and gras. So I'd be moving into the Côte de Bone. I would maybe be thinking, to your point, Rousseau, Saint Aubin, perhaps maybe a mm -hmm. Chassagne of some degree. It doesn't have the the nerve of Pouligny, mm -hmm. but it certainly is punching above its weight in terms of not being a Bourgogne, which is actually what it says on label. But I think this is a combination of a great vineyard interpreted by an extremely talented individual and um, focused to really speak to its place. And uh, one parting shot on the terms aromatic and semi-aromatic, you're always counseling people, helpfully Evan, to go back to a previous wine. If you go back to wine number one and you get that explosive Sauvignon Blanc fruit and then you go to wine number two and it really makes you pay attention to it, it pulls you in. Chardonnay is not an aromatic variety that doesn't make it lesser. It just means it makes it a little bit more quiet. We have to listen to it a little bit more closely. Most definitely. And as a Bourgogne, everybody, even though it's a straight Bourgogne, if you could find this wine, I put it in my cellar. I think it's going to age <laughs> really, really well. All right, everyone. We're picking up wine number three, which is obviously a rosé. So uh, let's not phone that in because the color on a wine like this is very telling. And when I'm looking at it against a white surface, the center is absolutely, you know, the wine is see-through. You can read through this wine. But um, it's a true, very pale ruby red. And as you let your eye move to the very rim, there is a slight gradation of color, picking up maybe a little bit more yellow in the rim as it travels along. So um, this, the color itself, I would say is um, pale ruby and towards the rim it turns into the famous Eau de Perdrix or salmon color. Then on the nose and on the palate, what occurred to me when I was uh, nosing this wine initially is that the fragrance is not terribly forthcoming. It's mild. So I'm going to discuss the fragrance and the flavor together. And the flavor at my tasting is far more generous, but it is mirroring the whisper of the nose. So tying them both together, um, red fruit, red berries, sour cherries specifically. And the damnedest thing, it's got an expression especially aromatically in mid palate of watermelon, which is very juicy. Um, orange, but more sour orange. You know, it's a little bit of unripe orange. Um, and uh, in terms of a floral expression, absolutely fresh flowers, maybe a little orange blossom. Um, it's got uh, a back tone on the palate of um, like tea leaf, a very attractive bitterness, or maybe um, mixed um, dried herbs, maybe a little garrigi element to it. Um, I think there must have been, well, obviously there's skin contact uh, or, you know, we, we don't know if this is a rosé made intentionally, if it's direct press or not, but there's a little bit of uh, gentle tannins, a little bit of phenolic uh, character to it. The acidity is very interesting. It's absolutely mouthwatering, but it doesn't command your attention. The alcohol is in there, but it's balanced. This doesn't, you know, they're not fighting to get this wine right. Um, it's got actually significant complexity. And the thought occurs to me, this wine needs a little bit of bottle age. So lest you think rosés can't handle or even need bottle age, I think this is an, exam uh, an example of one. And it's delicious. It makes me want to smell it and taste it again. Evan? Yeah, yeah I, I would say this is definitely in the, uh, first of all, I could listen, you know, they talk about rosé all day. I could listen to Madeline all day. Your descriptors Aww. are spot on. Um, first of all, this is not a porch pounder of a rosé. This is a serious mm. wine. It's a food wine. It's a young wine. It is a wine, to your point, that needs some bottle age and will continue to improve for easily um, three to four years, I think, and uh, and be better and more interesting over time. I think you nailed everything, but I would add a couple of other things. I think your tea is like constant comment 
tea. I think your, <laughs> spice, your, your, yes. Yeah, spice and stuff like <laughs> and that. And orange. And right. orange, yeah. I, I think your watermelon thing is spot on. I also think that it might have something to do with the grape variety or varieties that uh, this could be mm -hmm. from. And I think it's juicy. I think it's cherries, all that red fruit that you got there. But at the palate is serious. It does have a hint of, of phenolic or that sort of bitterness there that one would associate at some level um, in all likelihood with skin. Um, probably not so much with um, wood. I don't think this wine probably saw wood or if it did, it was gargantuan, old and whatever. But it is a wine of gravitas. It is a rosé of the kings. It is not a rosé of the masses <laughs> who are sitting there drinking it on their boats floating out in a lake. Um, it's a serious wine. Um, and I bet it's a wine that has a tradition of rosé. It's making me hungry, actually. And by the way, it is not, it, it needs food. A little bit of olive oil um, dribbled on any damn thing would be great. This wine, and I didn't mention it, my bad. There is definitely underneath everything an expression of earth in this wine. Oh. This is not just spectacular fruit. You know, there's both organic and inorganic, um, that hackneyed word minerality, you know, uh, that yeah. speaks to uh, a thumbprint of a place. So and not as much, just briefly before we move in and figure out where we're from, not as much as that stoniness that we saw in um, the wine that we had earlier, that, that Bourgogne, but it is a little bit more chanterelle mushroom. It is a little bit more white mushroom. It is a little bit more, dare I say, lightly whitely truffled. I mean, there's definitely some there, but it's more organic earth to me than it is organic earth, but the earth is there. Complex pink wine. So we're leaving Detroit. Where are we flying to? We've spoken to uh, about a serious rosé that has a mm -hmm. sense of place um, that could actually handle bottle age, certainly um, is gastronomic and that it is begging for food. And yes, we are in Tavel. So we are going to the Southern Rhone Valley. We are in the only Appalachian uh, that is exclusive to rosé. It is a stone's throw from another Appalachian famous rosé uh, uh, for rosé called Le Rock, but not exclusive to it. And this is uh, a beautiful example uh, by my estimation. And here is the label reveal, Tavel, Appellation Tavel Controle. It is, um, uh, I don't know if it's a lieu de or it is a um, proprietary name, Les Englatiers, but I will tell you uh, that it refers to the roses um, that are Mediterranean and specific to that region. Uh, Brot, B-R-O-T-T-E, is the family. Uh, so this is from their property. And they also produced uh, Côte d'Ivoire Village and uh, Côte d'Ivoire uh, AOC. I think it's a gorgeous example of Tavel. I think you could buy a case, open a bottle a year, open two bottles a year, you know, but make sure that um, you're munching something alongside of it. Yeah, Evan? I think, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you. It just, it, again, the sort of seriousness of the wine. I wonder if the vineyard in the picture is the same vineyard as is on the, the, the right-hand side, but I believe it is the name of the wine. I don't believe it sp speaks to a specifically a deer or a spot, mm -hmm. Madeline, but it is a, a, it should. I mean, it is a wine of such depth and richness. I think when people are thinking about how do I get there, number one, Tavelles always have a fairly, the, the serious Tavelles. They're sort of like pretty Tavelle that you sort of quaff on your porch, as I said before. But the more serious Tavelles have this color here, which has almost the depth of like a clare out of Bordeaux, which is that mm -hmm. sort of, it's not a rosé, but it ain't a red wine either. It's somewhere in between. And what you get here is that color. And, they're, and when you see the wine of that color, to me, it's either going to be this part of the world, or it's gonna be Bordeaux. And the amount of it made in Bordeaux is very little for that color. Mm -hmm. But when you smell it and when you taste it, that's when it gives away Rhone. Because I think to your point, uh, remember we talked about the watermelon before. And watermelon to mm -hmm. me is an absolute bird dog to Grenache when I'm tasting my uh, rosés, mm -hmm. whether you're in Spain, uh, in Nevada, whether you're in Tavel, whether you're everywhere. If you get that watermelon note, it's probably Grenache. I think you get the Syrah structure in the wine. It adds a little bit of uh, backbone to it, but uh, it's a wine that is at once fruity, but also savory, a little earthy and serious, and again, craving food. All of those things put together to me almost always equal Tavel. Onward to wine four. It's about time we had a little bit of red wine, a nice transition after that rosé. And this wine, very much like the rosé, is not super deep in pigmentation. It's not semi-opaque, much less opaque. I can actually read through it. Uh, the color itself is a nice sort of faded ruby. My edge is getting towards a, um, 
I wish it's more ruby, but not faded, but a medium ruby, but more of sort of like a pushing towards a pink rim. The nose, and I'm gonna do what you did. I like what you did with conflating your, um, your aromas and your flavors and your textures and all that together. I'm struck by the um, two things on this one. Number one, this sort of uh, very strong red berry character. Ripe for sure, but red berry. I'm getting strawberry, I'm getting raspberry. I'm getting both bing cherry, a little bit of sour cherry or that Montmorency cherry that you talk about in mm -hmm. Michigan, but a little bit more on the riper side. I'm getting spice elements, cinnamon, a little bit of clove. Um, just a touch of cola, if I could say that, and then some florals, roses, um, roses, 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 a lot of roses, and and a bit of citrus peel, you know, a little bit of maybe orange or uh, tangerine, but not dry, fresh, uh, adding that, a bit of sassafras maybe, a lot going on here, but very defined in a fairly singular voice as far as like it, it sort of starting to take the shape of, lack of better words, a grape. In the mouth, It's a pretty generous wine. Um, the wine actually might have been, by virtue of what it looked like, and some of the elements of, of, of smell, um, been a little bit lighter, a little bit leaner, a little bit brighter. And this has nice acidity. I mean, very bright acidity, medium plus acidity, but it's got some weight. It's got some generosity. It's got some grip. It's got some tannin. It's made in a more amplified volume style whatever it is I think that it's doing, but it's extremely well made. It shows pedigree. And while it shows um, a, a signature of grape, if you will. It also shows a signature of intent. Um, this is a stylized wine made intentionally in this way, I believe, by the winemaker. What do you think? Well, what you said, yes. And uh, <laughs> I love listening to you talk about wine. It's very structured. You know, it's interesting to me because it's got um, substantial but soft tannins. You know, they're not hard edge tannins. I think the tannin management is worth noting. The fruit is a combination to me of uh, black and red cherries. It's, you know, dominantly red with a little bit of black fruit. Um, I think the mid palate is packed. You know, this is um, fruit worth paying attention to. Interestingly, even though this wine speaks to a life ahead of itself, you know, I wouldn't mind a couple more years to start seeing layers because it can handle it big time. It doesn't speak much of the earth to me. Maybe a little bit of organic earth, but that's not um, that's not a compelling factor in this wine. It's um, certainly uh, structured, even muscular, actually, with uh, firm natural acidity. I'd bet big money and uh, lots of uh, smooth tannins. I think your point about tannin is well taken because I do think that the tannins are more quantitative than they come off as. And I think it does taste um, in the mouth structurally from a management standpoint as somebody who really knows what they're doing to manage the grip on the wine, to pull a little bit without drying out, without being astringent, which is being at once, I think, true to um, a style, but also true to a variety. Great. Okay, are you guys right. ready for number? Yeah. Are you sure? Where did I'm, it not? What didn't it record? I any of it. it. I don't the think it thing. recorded any of it. Okay. Gosh, well, let's start back into that. None of number four? No, 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 no. no, no just the, just the Google four. Earth part. Just the Google Oof. Earth part. This is not a tragedy. This is just an annoyance. But an it was it was really oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> it was right. really good. You back guys. Back to Tavel. Back to Tavel. All right. This is so crazy. Those Google um, are bastards. I don't even know where Let's blame it on that. is. No, okay, you guys can see the little. You guys can see the little um, recording thing, right? So just where? keep me. What little recording thing? I don't even know where it is. There's a little like bullseye, like a target sign somewhere on. No. The... No, I'm not saying. Oh, that. there it is, upper left hand corner. Perfect. It says recording. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go back to Tavel. Yep, and then I'm going to go back to, I'm going to let it sit for a sec so that we don't kill it. <clears throat> and we're recording throughout this thing so that I can just get there. All right, here we go. I'm going to, I, I will cue you, Evan, it's your mm -hmm. wine. So you're going to talk about Sebastopol. Here we go. And we are going to leave Tabal right now. Much as it saddens me, 
to leave Tavel, I actually don't want to go back to Columbia, Missouri first. So I'm going to start in Tavel because I'd actually have a little pied de terre there if I could. It's one of my favorite little towns of France. But I don't think that this wine that we're having in our glass right now is French. And I think you pointed to the fact that it didn't have that sort of signature um, old worldiness to it that you would associate. So I'm going to go back to the new world, go back to California, to the United States, to California. I'm going to wave at my house on the way past San Francisco. Hello, San Francisco. And I'm going to go to Sebastopol um, in Sonoma County. Now, Sebastopol sits at sort of the bottom part of the Russian River as we get to the close, but it is also sort of the fulcrum leading up to this great big appellation we call the Sonoma Coast. Now, Sonoma Coast, as I think you put it once, well, Madeline, is kind of like the Texas of appellations. It could be everything and anything. And in fact, many wines that are blended go across stuff that's in the very cool, cool north to the more warmer part, to literally into Carneros, which it could actually legally include. Both of the vineyards, and I believe this is a two vineyard blend, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Madeline, come from right around Sebastopol. And what I'm getting from that is a ripeness of fruit for sure, but I'm also getting um, a slightly tea leafy character, a slightly herbal character, and just a whisper of sort of that, uh, that, that, that sort of uh, conifer-ish thing that I associate actually further north and towards the coast, but you can get a, a sprinkling of it, a soupçon of it uh, here. And it's just a delightful wine. It speaks with a singular voice. I believe it to be pure Pinot Noir. And we are at LaRue Winery. Now, a lot of you have probably never heard of LaRue before. And um, now you have, and you should put this on your checklist of Sonoma Coast signature styles of Pinot Noir to know. Uh, Katie Wilson, uh, who is the winemaker there, depicted on the right side of the screen as a superbly talented um, winemaker. A new mom, I might uh, add as well. Go, Katie. And um, she's been making Pinot Noir for a long time. She actually, most recently, before starting her own label, LaRue was working up at Flowers Winery. And many of us who are fans of Pinot Noir know and love flowers too. And I think what you could tell by virtue of this is not only does she understand the signature of her area, but she also has a very um, intended style that she's putting forward, which has got a little bit more volume to it, but just delicious. Um, and well managed in the tannins, as you said before, and a, you know, all Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir should taste this good. You could mistake it for Russian River, actually, um, uh, in a blind tasting. I wanted to add something that, you know, a silly question occurred to me. So why is it called LaRue? Viona LaRue Newell was her great grandmother. Uh, evidently a dominant personality, strong and witty and an inspiration. So Katie chose to uh, name her winery after her great grandmother, Biona LaRue, her maiden name. Isn't that cool? There you go. That's very cool. And that's why I love working with you, Madeline, because I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm going to say once, I did not know that. But it's great to know a great tribute and a great bottle of wine. Okay. All right. We are on red wine. Number five. Number so five. Uh, this is where the appearance gets very interesting. Uh, I can't overstate how important it is. It tells you what's about to happen. So what you have is, um, uh, I would say, a medium full ruby red center. But as your eye moves to the rim, you have a gradation of color. The hue changes from a dark ruby to a lighter ruby to a ruby with elements of yellow and maybe even a little bit orange, which can speak to bottle age but can also speak to grape variety. It moves with some weight in the glass, which speaks to, um, you know, not low alcohol levels, not necessarily elevated, but we're really cheating ourselves if we don't give the appearance it's due. Aromatically and on the palate, I'm gonna do it one-stop shopping. Mm. This wine is complex, right from the right shot out of the gun. It has, um, Wonderful, perfectly ripe, verging into slightly jammy um, fruit, dominantly red, um, a little bit even of raisinated or dried fruit as well. Uh, but it's not overdone at all. It's simply an element. It's got a little black fruit in there. Uh, the floral element is quite prominent on this wine. And I would say fresh and dry, but mostly dried lavender, roses. I mean, um, aromatic flowers, that are not commanding your attention. Right on the heels of that um, are elements of uh, fennel, AKA licorice, maybe a little mushrooms, um, dried herbs. I mean, multi-layered wine. You know, I get the impression actually 
um, from the freshness of it, really mouthwatering acidity, gently gritty tannins that this is relatively young. I don't think it has significant bottle aging, even though we saw a little bit of yellow in the rim. And I think going back to the fruit, it's a combination of you know, uh, ripe and tart red fruit, cherries, pomegranate, maybe a little bit red plum too. Um, it absolutely has a thumbprint of both inorganic and organic earth. And there's another element as well. There is what the French lovingly call animal. There's a little bit of leather in there, uh, not in a way that's disturbing. I'm not saying that it's a big red Britannomyces flag. I'm just saying that there's a little bit of saddle leather in there. And in terms of oak, I think it's more neutral than uh, new. You know, there's no wall of vanilla and sweet baking spices. So to pull back um, a relatively young, but quite complex red with dominantly red fruit, both ripe and dried, a strong floral element, plenty of earth. Um, and all in all, structurally, I would say uh, moderately uh, gritty tannins, though well-managed, mouthwatering acidity, and this speaks to quality and potential. It's very intriguing. Evan? What you said, I, I really have <laughs> very little to add. I, I, I thought that was an absolute um, laser, uh, lasered um, description of, of this specific wine. Merci. I, uh, uh, I, 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 I want to echo your comments on the sort of fresh and dried elements there. I want to echo your comments on the uh, animal or maybe some something else there going on. A little bit of meatiness, a little bit of, of, of uh, something on there. The florals, fresh and dried. I must have sort of like a red driven potpourri-ish thing going on, if you could talk about that. Spiciness, for sure, but ample amounts of fruit. The tannins, I think, are there. They're inherent, they're big, but they're different. You know, the tannin here is, I think, amplified by the by the nature of the earthiness somewhat, and then it's not that sort of classic drying astringent tannin, but it's a gritty kind of tannin. I'm actually feeling it literally like right here, like underneath my uh, gums a little bit in a nice sort of pulling way. I like the fact that it's as much savory as it is fruity. I like the herb element. I think that the fennel and some of the root vegetable elements that you that you brought out, the bulb vegetables are spot on in this wine. I think the structure's there. The acid um, shows uh, really, really nicely in this wine, kind of medium plus there and everything comes together. The one thing that I think though, really the only thing that you didn't point out, which, um, and this is just a, a gut thing of 30 something years of 40 something years of drinking wine, is it doesn't come off new world to me at all. This yeah. has to be an old world wine. There's just too if much- If this therapy. were new world and I'm interrupting you and if even if I were staring at the label, I wouldn't believe it, you know, but sometimes that happens. And I want to remind us all that acidity and tannin can play off each other. I think you taught me this that if the acidity can push up the tannin and vice versa as well. So this is in no way, I would bet money, a, adjusted acidity. This is natural acidity that is scooching up the tannin. Thank you for letting me uh, step on your comments, Evan. No worries. Brava, brava. And now <laughs> let's start thinking about where we are. Where are we? We got to record. For, there it's recording. Here we go. All right, now we go. So I'm going to go to Randazzo and you can start right now. So where are we with this beautiful, complex, rich, intriguing um, red that we would bet money is from the old world? We are leaving Sebastopol and we are taking a trip. Yes, indeed, across the Atlantic. And where are we going to in Europe? We are going to the Mediterranean. We are going to Sicily. We are going to the north slopes of Etna. And you can see it right there. This is a township, Randazzo, which Evan reminded me, it's not the uh, Americanization Randazzo, which is located near where um, the relatively small estate uh, that produces this wine is located. This is dominantly um, the superstar grape variety on Etna, Narello Mascalese, and it is supplemented with its partner, um, which is commonly called Narello Cappuccio, but where this producer refers to it as Narello Mantelato. Okay, you know, and um, what we have, north facing slopes of Mount Etna, we are at around 2000 feet above sea level, 
You know, that's not a small uh, element uh, because we're in Sicily. We are north facing slopes, which mitigates the heat as well. We have big time influence from uh, maritime winds, AKA we're in the middle of the Mediterranean. And I think this is um, a glorious expression of a grape variety that I think has tremendous nobility and whose book hasn't been um, written yet. Though people will often say, people in the trade, their little uh, phrases, if uh, Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo had a baby, uh, it might end up being called Norello Mascalese. <laughs> and here we are, the producer is Ripi Du uh, at Naroso. This is a 2018, and it actually refers to um, a specific uh, crew, Calderara Sotana, which I wasn't aware of, which also speaks to its uh, nobility. But if you look at the soil, it's not easy to see in this picture. This is volcanic spill that has degraded into plantable um, earth. So you have a tremendous influence of um, volcanic minerality, right, Evan? Yeah, no, and, and, and I, I think that one of the things that seems to pull volcanic wines together, whether you're here in Etna, whether you're in Hungary, whether you're in um, the mountains of, of Northern Sonoma, whether you're in the Canary Santorini. Islands. Santorini. <laughs> Santorini, sorry, darling, um, is going to be a sort of grip, a grit that I said before that sort of uh, uh, at once a mineral, but also gritty. In fact, um, John Zabo, fellow master sommelier, good friend of ours, wrote a book called Salt and Grit, just about volcanic wines. Mm -hmm. I think this uh, hopefully is intriguing you to pay attention to Etna and Norello Mascalese. And a personal aside, having been there, and I told Evan, if I had, if he wants his summer home in Tavel, I want my winter home on Etna because it has just incomparable um, barren, austere beauty. And uh, they make terrific white wines there as well, especially the ones from Caricante. But uh, I'm thrilled that we included this in this tasting. Now on to wine six, last but certainly not least. If a wine is dark, and opaque and you can't, I call this wine a CSB, can't see bottom of the glass. It is so dark, so concentrated, so rich, and it is a purpley sort of color with a light purpley uh, edge to it and just speaks to me of a wine that is going to be so concentrated and powerful when we go ahead and smell it and taste it. And right off the bat, I'm getting this incredible combination of black fruit, and blue fruit with a very strong indication of blue fruit like blueberries and boysenberries. Clearly there's lots of black plum, there's lots of black cherry, there's lots of black berry, and it's got almost, I don't wanna say jammy in the sense of cooked, Madeline, but it's got that so deep concentrated element to it, like maybe more like pie fruit or something where you've desiccated by roasting or something. So it's not jammy, but it's really concentrated. I'm also getting a lot of floral, um, violets for sure, but uh, also lavender. I'm picking up notes of licorice, black licorice. I'm picking notes of fennel. Um, I'm picking up a distinctive um, stony minerality to the wine, but with such explosive fruit at the same time. It's again, a little bit herbal uh, and uh, licorice as I said before. And that is a mouthful of wine. The wine has got, uh, you used the word tension earlier, and this wine shows mm -hmm. tremendous tension because it's, it's holding up all of this fruit, all of this density, all of this volume, all of this concentration, and does so with a combination of a big trunk of acidity. There's a sharpness to the wine, but it also does so with tannins that are at once ample, but well managed in the context. This is not a wimpy wine. The tannins are big, they are drying, but not in an unpleasant way, but it really craves some food or some bottle age on it. And it's a wine of um, ferocity in its own way. Comes off to me as being something that's slightly cooler climate, but also in a place that is ripe enough to give you that, that combination, that tension between ripeness uh, generosity, but also acid, brightness, crunchiness, and tannin, and incredible length. I can still taste this wine. What do you think, Madeline? Well, you know, uh, that's a pretty heroic wine you just described. I don't know if I can PS much other than I want to um, riff on what you just said about the acidity. It is, to me, obviously natural, 
ver verging on um, almost salty, you know, and, and beautifully integrated. This is a wine that speaks to me of a growing region where a wine can get this ripe and not lose its acidity, either due to a combination of who knows, maritime influence, altitude, diurnal swings. I'm just reminding us of, you know, this can be anywhere, new world or old world where this can happen. I love that you punch the blue fruit because blue fruit doesn't often manifest in wines that's concentrated. And I'm from Michigan, perfectly ripe blueberries, tra-la, you know, and it's not so much cooked. It, it's hard to define it, but the fruit is so concentrated. It's almost as if you took some of the water out of it to concentrate uh, the fruit. Um, you know, the other thing that occurs to me, I don't get much of any or any um, uh, pyrazines in this wine. I don't, you know, pick up bell pepper or green elements. I'm utterly uh, intrigued by the tannin management on this wine because it's significant, but you can taste through the wine. Do you agree with me on uh, the lack of... Um, of you know green uh, tones on this wine. Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of like sort of like just herbal pops in there, but it's not green at all. The other thing right. I am not getting, not only am I not getting green, I'm not getting any really oak. You know, there's nothing there. There's no vanilla. There's no baking spice. There's no toast. There's no cardamom. There's no exotic. There's no vanilla. I mean, I'm, if it's there, there, it's invisible to your yeah, point. Yeah, or, or, or it's so yeah. big or so large or so old mm -hmm. or whatever that you're not getting it. But it's not a wine where oak is part of its personality and probably no. by intent. But the floral aspect absolutely is going back to one of the first things you said. We often forget about a floral expression in reds and this has it big time. You know, uh, and I find it so pretty as a result. And it's neat that juxtaposition, juxtaposition of his pretty nose and this heroic uh, uh, palette. Okay. Well, as we move around here, this wine ain't Italian. I can I can tell you that, but it does share something here. That that that, that acidity and structure with the generosity of fruit. These two wines have in common, but it doesn't feel as old world. So we're gonna get up. We're gonna take a really fast helicopter ride or a whatever kind of ride and go around the world, literally over. We're not only gonna traverse continents, we're also gonna traverse hemispheres too. And we're moving down to Argentina and we're moving into the area of Mendoza, the greater area of Mendoza, but we're moving specifically into the Valle de Uco or the Uco Valley and more specifically into the subzone uh, the deal of Tunuyan, or as they like to say locally, Tunujan, and specifically Tunujan. into Pajare Altamira, uh, the Altamira area, which is getting um, discussion for literally becoming a crew area within Argentina. The wines have such definement, such um, uh, signature that you're starting to see it much more uh, label designated and much more even plot designated. This so Uco Valley, Pajare Altamira, Mendoza, Argentina, Sebastian Zucardi. Sebastian Zucardi, who's down there in that lower picture, there doesn't even look old enough to be at the cutting edge of what's <laughs> driving Argentinian wines today. But I think if you have a conversation about Malbec in Argentina, it would be incomplete without uh, speaking to the contributions that Sebastian and his family uh, have made over time. Uh, they were amongst the first people, along with the Catenas and several others, to really go out there and start doing micro terroir focuses here and have, along with the Catenas and other people, um, found out in this place, Altamira, Pajare Altamira, is so special. Um, we're in the Uco Valley. So for those of you who are sitting there going, okay, I sort of get that it's Malbec Evan, but I'm not really getting how I would determine Uco Valley. Think of the entire area of Mendoza. Bear with me for a second, indulge me, as being a lot like the Rhone Valley. When you're in the warmer, more inland areas here, around Mendoza City, around Luján de Cuyo, around Maipo, those areas are more like the Southern Rhone. They're warmer, they're lower, and the fruit tends to be more generous, the tannins rounder, the wines creamier and smoother. When you move up a couple of thousand feet in altitude, and literally here you're talking about vineyards that are at the base of the Andes Mountains, it's cooler. Um, you have much more, as Madeline talked about before, extremes between diurnal exchange, the hots of hots and the cools of cools during the course of the day. And this preserves acidity. It slows down the ripening process. Yet at the same time, because you're so much higher, you're going to get much more pigmentation development. You're going to get much more flavor development simply because the UV protection that the grapes get is not 
as much. Think about it. When we go into intense sun at high altitudes, if you climb mountains, what do you do? Lather yourself with sunscreen. Well, grapes can't do that, but they can make for thicker skins and create wines of incredibly distinct intensity. Madeline? I made the comment that, you know, you gave this to me blind, I'd bet money there was Cabernet in it. But, you know, for that reason that Evan's talking about, but he correctly um, uh, reminded me that this particular area of, uh, of uh, Mendoza, aka Valle uh, de Uco, and, you know, more specifically Altamira, Cabernet can't get ripe here often enough to be in here. So this is 100% Malbec. And Greek girl that I am, I have to tell you that polygonos in Greek means um, many angles, or gonia um, means corner, actually. And um, um, the Zucardis say that this is expression of all the towns of the valley and uh, a weird geometry as diverse as the sides of a polygon, as diverse as the wines of each town. So they are celebrating the um, specificity of the region, but the diversity of the towns in this uh, multi-angled wine from the Lord. Well, with that completion of wine number six, um, we're done. So I wanna thank all of you out there in MTW land for listening and spending time. I wanna thank you, Madeline, for your um, incredible Pro, 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 prophetic and prosaic <laughs> prose uh, participating here. And I want to remind everybody out there in the Master of the World community that next month, November, Kit 2023A, Kit 123A will be live again in our usual webinar format. And stay tuned. You'll get more information, of course, in your email box soon. Until then, see you next time. Enjoy your wine drinking. And remember, master the world of wine.